Hi. Let's discuss a few of the properties of the complex power mapping we've introduced. Now remember the uh, power mapping, the complex power z to the alpha, is defined as e raised to the alpha times the logarithm of z. And whenever you take a complex power, um, it's often the case that you have multiple answers because there are multiple values of the logarithm. So let's talk about this in a bit more depth. If we want to talk about just a single value of 2 to the minus i, or, or z to the alpha in general, it's convenient to talk about the principal value of z, z to the alpha. Now to define the principal value, we're going to uh, use the particular value of the logarithm given by the principal value of the logarithm. So the principal value of z to the alpha is defined as e raised to the alpha times the principal value of the logarithm of z. Right now, Remember the principal value of the logarithm was uh, defined by taking the logarithm of the modulus of z and then adding i times the principal value of the argument. So what that means in particular, if we want to find 2 raised to the minus i and we're asked for the principal value of 2 raised to the minus i, we're going to go through the same steps we saw in previous videos, um, except that instead of dealing with a general argument of uh, 2 in this case, what we want is the principal value of the argument. Now the principal value of the argument of 2 is just 0. Uh, we ignore the 2k pi that we usually put in there. and uh, Or in other words, uh, in effect, we could also just substitute k equals 0. If we follow that through with k equals 0, we'll see that this number here is the principal value of 2 raised to the minus i. Similarly, in the other example from previous videos, we took the uh, value of 2 minus i raised to the 3i, and once again this was a multiple valued output, but the principal value of 2 minus i raised to the 3i is the one that will be obtained from taking the principal value of the argument of 2 minus i. Now the principal value of the argument, remember, is always a value between negative pi and positive pi. The inverse tangent of minus 1 half is such a value, and so if we were to find the principal value, all we would need to do, again, is just to put 0 in for k. And that will get rid of this and uh, give us the principal value. And once again, that principal value is this uh, expression that corresponds to k equals 0. Now alternatively, if we knew from the outset that all we wanted was the principal value, we could just go through using the definition. Uh, the principal value, we would start with the a principal value of the logarithm, which again is involves the principal value of the argument, and there's only one answer for that, and so there will be only one output for uh, this principal value, and uh, we get the same number we we saw on the previous slide. All right, now to use some of the terminology we've introduced in class, remember that a branch of a multiple-valued function f is a function f1 that is an honest-to-goodness function. It gives only one output for each input. Now this branch is a continuous function on some domain, and it assigns exactly one function of the multiple values it has to choose from to each point in the domain. That's exactly what this principal value of z to the alpha does. Remember, we're taking one particular output of z to the alpha, and it is a continuous function in uh, most of the complex plane. Now let's talk about where it's not. Remember that a branch cut is a curve that is excluded from the domain of the function so that f1 is continuous everywhere else. Now the principal value um, is continuous everywhere except where the uh, argument is discontinuous. Remember that the principal value of the argument has um, a discontinuity along the, uh, the negative real axis and at the origin. So the non-positive real axis is where z to the alpha will also jump if you're moving around the complex plane. It's discontinuous there, and so it is the branch cut associated with the principal value of z to the alpha. If we were to throw away the non-positive real axis, everywhere else this function z to the alpha would be continuous. All right, now moving on, um, there are a few algebraic and uh, calculus properties that are going to transfer to these complex powers in much the same way um, they held for real value to functions and variables. For instance, if I take z raised to a, a complex power, the power rule for the derivative is very, very much the same as it is for um, powers of, of x. 
Now also uh, there's an exponents rule. If I have both z1 and z2 and I'm raising that quantity to the alphath power, where here alpha can be a complex number, then as in earlier algebra classes with real numbers, the exponent can be attached to both z1 and z2 individually. It's also the case that if you have a complex power inside of an, a, an expression where the power we're raised to on the outside is a real integer, a positive integer, then it is the case that we can times the two exponents together. However, and this is where the warning comes in, it's not true, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not, that when you have a complex exponent inside of another complex exponent that you can times the two complex exponents together. In general, the left-hand side will not equal the right-hand side, and your homework will take a look at an example where that is the case. Now, this gives us a bit of caution. We need to, uh, to worry before using any properties that we know to be true for the real exponential or, or power functions. We need to worry about whether they're actually true. We need to prove that they're true before using them um, in our work with complex powers. One uh, question that your book leaves unanswered is this. If we have uh, the same base and two different exponents, and we're timesing these together, is it allowed to just add the two exponents together inside of the exponent of a, of a single copy of that base? Now this is true for real valued uh, functions. Is it true for complex powers? Now another example might uh, of a property that is not true, it might be true, it might not, we just we need to uh, take a look, closer look at it, is this derivative rule. Now when alpha is a real number raised to a, a variable and you're taking the derivative with respect to that variable, the derivative would normally be the natural log of that real number rate times, uh, times the original function. Is that still the case when alpha is a complex power? Uh, try it out. Let me know what you find. All right, well, this concludes our discussion about the properties of complex powers. If you have further questions or if you make any progress on these open questions, let me know.